the water. And it remains are very humble. But what is saddening is that many of the timbers are on the beach at your feet, and uh, many have uh, had their, you know, very large, long nails removed, etc., etc. So I think that really brings into focus your repeated mentioning of the need to protect these sites. Yes, without question, this we, we could see deterioration of, of this historic site if it's not protected. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think that's why the Norwegians have actually reclaimed the mod and purchased the mod. I think it was for a dollar from the Hudson's Bay Company in the early 80s. And, uh, and why they've since decided that we had that for 70, 80, 100 years in Canada, and we didn't do anything to protect it. And, uh, and so I think the Norwegians and the, the maritime historians in Norway uh, felt quite strongly about it and to launch this, this mission, this self-funded mission. Uh, to go and, and reclaim, to recover the mod and take it back and restore it into a museum. Uh, it is, you know, while I'm sad to see it go and a little angry to see it leave Canada at the same time, I'll be excited to be able to see it in uh, still somewhat, uh, in some state, a, a recognizable as a ship in Norway in a maritime museum. Just an observation, because I was here early enough to walk around the lot. The boat dimensions are virtually identical. 100 years apart. The, the rock's just over 100 feet long, and I've forgotten what the beam was. So they're both strength and wood boats. And <coughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that's because of its intended purpose as a, as a ship that would, would spend time in the north, and perhaps it's the, the golden ratio of, of shipbuilding or something like that. But, but that's an interesting observation, and I think that everybody, uh, when we part ways, should go into the, the atrium over there and just imagine what it would be like to have the Erebus in a similar sort of state, um, which is unlikely probably to ever happen. We will we'll say never, but um, protecting these sorts of ships is, is very difficult um, because they're made of both wood and steel, and the conditions necessary to preserve these two different uh, media are, are often at odds with each other. So, A couple of questions. Uh, first of all, if there was any human remains, wouldn't they have disintegrated over the years? <laughs> yeah, so the question is, would the human remains have disintegrated over time? Um, yeah, the bones, yeah, the bones would probably still uh, be intact. Um, the cold water is remarkable in its ability to preserve. Yeah. It was if it was somewhere else, but not in certainly, the certainly. Um, and the other thing, the equipment that found it, was it the same kind of uh, expensive toy like that you yellow toy that came in that blue box? Right, so... so <laughs> That's a great summary. Yes, so, so again, that, the, the AUV that we were using uh, was autonomous, so you could program missions into it and it would, it would mow the lawn. They didn't, actually. They had what's called a tow fish, so they had that uh, HMS investigator that uh, we showed you lifting from our ship onto the, um, the icebreaker, and they would actually tow it behind with a cable, and then it would just be they towed behind. Pictures, eh? Yeah, exactly. So um, less sophisticated, but equally as effective in this case. <laughs> I'll jump in and just say that uh, the, the Sir Wilfrid Laurier uh, was the Coast Guard ship, had a multi-beam sonar attached to the hull of the ship on a, on a post, uh, the the Canadian Navy ship had one that was installed as well, but she never made it into the search area due to the heavy ice. But the the ships the boats with the Sir Wilfrid Laurier that was the uh, the Kinglet and the Gannet and and the Investigator the two Canadian hydrographic survey vessels and the Parks Canada boat the RV Investigator not the HMS the HMS Investigator was McClure's ship that uh, sank. But uh, we uh, I get that one wrong as well every time. Uh, but those three boats were actually towing arrays behind them, multi-beam sonars or side scan arrays behind them. And uh, and it was the act of towing that meant they had to stay in the southern search area uh, because they couldn't tow in ice. They couldn't work their way around ice without losing their toes behind. So they stayed in the southern search area. And uh, the same with the Coast Guard ship. She couldn't work in the ice when she had the multi-beam deployed on the side of the ship, or the first piece of ice would have just peeled that multi-beam array off the side of the ship. Uh, so uh, that's why they stayed in the southern search area where we had the autonomous vehicle that could leave the ship on its own. We were able to work in and around the ice, not underneath the ice, but around it. Or 
bring another Katy Perry concert next year. Are you two <laughs> planning on heading out to look for the terror? Yeah, Barry. Well, depends. I haven't seen her concert schedule, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the question barring another Katy Perry concert. Are we planning to be back up there? I think uh, it's going to be hard to keep us out of the Arctic next summer if there is a is a, a mission uh, planned. We've uh, offered the ship again uh, and, and and arranged our schedule, our itinerary for our ships uh, from the Arctic. Our ship had to uh, uh, pour pour the coal on and and head south and. Uh, and our ship is about three days from, four days from Ushuaia now, and ready to start the Antarctic season on the weekend. In fact, I'm on my way down to Ushuaia on Saturday uh, to join the ship. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah, we've made the ship available, and uh, and it's really dependent on what Parks Canada's plans are for next summer, and uh, and really it's the government agencies again coming together, planning uh, Coast Guard time, Canadian Hydrographic Survey time, and uh, and if all that once they get that worked out, then they'll come and ask us if uh, if it's not too late if we can uh, get involved. And and again, we've made ourselves available, and we'll see. Uh, we we can't wait. Have you got permission to leave home? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, maybe next year the family will come up with me. And uh, but uh, yeah, it's not really a permission thing. My wife understands the polar bug; she's got it as well. And she's done over a hundred trips to both polar regions as well. So, it's um, yeah, it's uh, there's a bit of envy when I take off, but uh, but then I also miss my girls when I'm on the ship. So it. Uh, is, uh, is Franklin now considered to have been a competent mariner and a competent <laughs> explorer, or something else, considering what he took with him for equipment and the fact that he got lost. Well, we don't actually know that he got lost because getting lost would imply that he didn't know where he was and he might have known where he was but not been able to get out of there. Uh, was he considered a competent explorer? I would say, uh, you know, the hist maybe history has been a little unfair to him because there was no sign of him. But, but the fact is uh, this was either his third or his fourth expedition and his prior expeditions were incredible ordeals, including one where I think he survived off uh, the leather in his shoes. Uh, and lichen, rock tripe, I think it was, that he ended up eating to survive. And uh, and that wasn't such a good idea, as he found out. Uh, so uh, he, um, yeah, I think he was given credit, but uh, uh, I suppose we still don't know enough to decide whether his leadership uh, rivaled that of Sir Ernest Shackleton. And he single-handedly lost more men on one expedition <coughs> than all other Arctic voyages Combined. He single-handedly lost more men on one Arctic expedition than all other voyages combined. Uh, but given the weather at the time, uh, the, the cold snap, the heavy ice that year, uh, can you hold him fully accountable for it? I don't know yet. I, I, nobody really knows yet until we see more information. We can hypothesize there's a theory that the lead poisoning from the tin cans uh, led to decreased mental acuity and, and dementia and so on. Uh, maybe that had an impact. The scurvy, of course, it's known that the men, that some of the remains found were suffering from scurvy. That's not the, the that's not Franklin's job to provision the ships. He checks the provisions, but it's the British Admiralty with all their expertise that would have provisioned the ships. So is it his fault or the British Admiralty's? It's hard to say. Is it, is it, are we maybe a little too late to pass blame and just, uh, and, and keep the mystery going? That's the way I'm looking at it. Uh, he accomplished so much in in his expeditions, and the search for his expeditions accomplished so much more. So, in the back here. With respect to the hull, the hull of the ship, what type of wood was used in it? Uh, yeah. What <laughs> Oh, put the pressure on. Any other foresters in the room can help me with this? I would imagine there was a fair bit of oak in the hull. Uh, I don't know what was used to, to sheath the hull of the ship. And uh, I did re read it up at one point, but uh, I'm sorry, that hasn't, uh, that didn't stick in my in my mind. It, uh, I know it was reinforced and they resheathed it, but I'm, I don't have a clue what what the wood was there will be quite quite a quite a bit of information coming out when the canadian geographic uh, issue is released um which will be i think it's sometime soon because uh, we've had our last input uh, last chance to make any input to any articles that we're involved with so 
Um, but there should be more information on that when, when that's released. But I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Speculation on how that piece of iron got on the island at the helicopter saw the time. Speculation. Um, so it's thought that perhaps the ice just moved it there. So if it fell off maybe when the uh, ship was still above water um, and then landed on an ice flow, and then as the ice pans moved around uh, with the wind and it got deposited there is, is one way. Uh, there is a little bit of isostatic rebound in the area, but again, we're kind of dwelling in the area of speculation, and that's probably not sufficient to get it onto land from a, uh, a near shore underwater environment. So, so it probably just got there through the ice. We got we got back from from the ship and from the expedition, and uh, and you know we came back and onto land really to this news. Woke up the next morning after flying back from the Arctic and had this news. And uh, and there's a few people in the room who've nodded when we talked about Beachy Island or Bellet Strait. And I just want to get a show of hands of how many people have been up into this region. Well, a fair number of you. And on ship or by by land on ship for most of you, I think. Um, on the academic IAFE. And uh, we had some this afternoon uh, who were on the ship on the IAFE at the same time as we were on the Vavilov in the search time this summer. But... Uh, but it, it's interesting that when I got back into the office and all of our sales team in the office, we started getting emails and phone calls and, uh, and messages on, through social media. And, and uh, I was on the trip in 2011. And uh, how close did we get to where this wreck was found? And everybody wants to know. And, uh, and I, would, I can answer this, uh, that we probably sailed within 25 to 40 miles of that wreck. We didn't get into that area. It's not well charted. We tend to stay out of the poorly charted areas, uh, but um, but we sailed within. We would have sailed within sight of where that air, that where that shipwreck was found, and uh, and it's pretty incredible. But one patch of ocean floor to another in the Arctic. It's not really the ocean floor. It's the ice above, and it's the navigation. It's a challenge of getting there. And uh, and I know some of you have uh, already planned to be on the next UBC alumni trip up into the Northwest Passage, which happens. Uh, August of 2015, and uh, next August already, and uh, and uh, and there, I'm sure there will be other UBC alumni trips up there. And if you haven't been on on one of these trips, I'd encourage you. We will chase the hand of Franklin as we uh, as we reach for the Beaufort Sea and 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 look through the Arctic and explore. And uh, and so that uh, there's a soft sell at the end on uh, on the Northwest Passage. Uh, images we showed were from the passengers on the ship, as well as our staff, and uh, aside from the, the Parks Canada images, of course. But, uh, but that's what we experience when we're up there, and uh, every trip is, is a mystery and an exploration. Thank you for your attention this evening. I'll hand it back to Ken. Thank you, everyone, once again for coming. Uh, special thanks uh, to Worldwide Quest, our travel partner, to One Ocean Expeditions, and especially all of you for being here. We appreciate it, and uh, we thank you and hope to see you again soon in our travels.